Good morning and welcome to the continuation of this, these hearings. <clears throat> Before we begin today, I'd like to introduce our panel. I'm William Stuckey and I chair this council committee. To my right, right is Councillor Willie Curry and to my left is Peter Gurtis, GM Markets and Competition. Starting with Kristen Mkhlanga on my extreme left, we have Gladys Malefo, Luang <coughs> Mpakhleli, and then on my right, Impilo Ngo, Esther Manabili and Noma Makubu. The Authority has published a discussion document on a framework for introducing local loop unbundling. This document sets out the Authority's views on how Chapter 8 of the ECA, which pertains to facilities leasing, uh, makes provision for the unbundling of the local loop. For our purposes, the local loop is that, that portion of a network which connects the subscriber to the balance of an ECS licensee's electronic communications network. It should be noted that although the discussion document focused on the <coughs> very important copper local loop, LLU applies equally to other technologies. The purpose of this, these hearings is to hear stakeholder views on the issues raised in the discussion document and any related issues. With regards to matters of procedures for the, this inquiry, ICAS has published a discussion document on a proposed framework for LLU in terms of Government Gazette 34382 on the 22nd of June of this year. We've held one-on-one -on -one meetings with stakeholders on request. Written submissions were submitted by the 14th of September by all parties, with the exception of Solidarity, whose late submission was condoned. We are now conducting public hearings on the subject yesterday, today and tomorrow. The following procedure in terms of Section 4C1 of the ICASA Act will apply. The sequence of oral presentations by interested parties will follow the notice published on the website of the Authority. Each party will be afforded 40 minutes to make its oral presentation before the Committee, and this will be followed by a question and answer session. The Committee posing questions and the party responding thereto. There was a little confusion about who was asking questions yesterday. Um, all interested parties will be afforded a right of reply and rebuttal on Thursday, the 13th of October, as contemplated in Section 4C5B of the CASA Act 2000. The authority has not received a request from any of the parties that will be or already presenting before the committee for the inquiry to be held in camera in terms of Section 4C6B of the Act, and therefore the proceedings of the inquiry will be open to the public as contemplated in Section 4B6B <coughs> of the Act. The authority has chosen not to exercise the right to subpoena by notice in writing in the prescribed form any person who may be in possession or custody of documents or ob objects which may be reasonably necessary for the purpose of this inquiry as contemplated in section 4C2A through, through C of the ICASA Act. All parties are entitled to legal representation or other advise advisers when such parties make an oral representation contemplated in section 4B2B of the ICASA Act and the authority of all the committee has received two requests for confidentiality, namely from Telcom and Neotel. The committee, after discussion of the applicable legislation, <coughs> decided to grant confidentiality to the, to the <coughs> portions of the submissions from both licensees. We will welcome questions from the floor. These are to be written on the forms provided and handed to the committee. They will then be read out on behalf of the member of the public after the questions from the panel. After deliberating on the inputs received, the CASA will make findings and recommendations on the matter of a framework for LLU. This will be published together with reasons therefore. <coughs> we have been asked to grant permission for these proceedings to be streamed live. Since these hearings are public, we have granted permission on condition that no interference with the recording system occurs. The live streaming of this event is just one example of the positive benefits of access to the internet and the efficient use of technology and infrastructure. <coughs> And I remind everyone that cell phones interfere with the recording system, so they must all be switched off, please. And finally, I wel we welcome Celsi to open today's proceedings with their presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Mutibi Ramusi. I'm the Executive Head Regulatory Affairs at Celsi. And I'm joined by my colleagues who are going to form part of our presentation this morning. On my left, it's Harish, who will take us through the presentation this morning. And Harish is from the Regulatory Affairs, he's the Technical Manager, Senior Manager as well. Mark, Mark is the Strategic Implementation H Executive for Celsi. And Jimmy Peck, Senior Manager, Regulatory Affairs as well. And Bajir, He's our senior manager technical group. So between the five of us, we will take you through in terms of uh, our 
understanding and contribution towards the process that ICASA has actually started. And I must apologize up front. Uh, we are supposed to have been joined by two of our other colleagues. They are not here due to other business uh, activities. Now, just a way of kick, kick starting this process, um, on behalf of CELSI, may I take this opportunity to thank uh, the ICASA panel, including the chair, to, for us to address the whole issue around the unbundling of the local loop. And I, was, I want to emphasize unbundling of the fixed line local loop. I think I'm placing my emphasis on that. But over and above that, we commend and support the authority for undertaking this complex process because we believe that there are benefits that can be derived from this particular process. Now I'm going to hand over to Harish, who will take us through the presentation. And um, like as I've indicated, in between, if there are any other clarity questions, my colleagues will come in. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Councillor Curry and committee members. The presentation is made of uh, three sections. It's basically general comments and concerns, spe uh, specific comments with regards to the questions as set out in the discussion paper and conclusion. Um, it's a basic summary of our presentation, uh, of our uh, written submission, so it's not that quite uh, substantive. CELC so supports the definition of the LLU as contained in the discussion paper, and as it states, the local loop is a physical circuit uh, connecting the electronic communication network termination point at the subscriber's premises to the main distribution frame or equivalent facility in an electronic communication network and or means the physical twisted, uh, twisted metallic pair circuit connecting the electronic communication network point at the subscriber's premises to a connection point at the edge of the provider's network or a specified intermediate network point. ICASA's objectives of considering the introduction of the local loop unbundling. The objectives, we believe, is the 2007 report on LLU commissioned by the DOC, which refers to the unbundling of the fixed line local loop. ICASA stated objected on our one on one meeting where uh, the un local loop unbundling is to significantly increase the low brand, brand penetration in South Africa. Our evaluation is the South African fixed line market is monopolistic and therefore unbundling the local loop should increase competition and lead to more affordable fixed broadband offers. Including wireless in the local loop discussion does not help ECASA to achieve its objective of broadband growth. For a mobile operator, rolling out a broadband network will result in some areas being more profitable to serve than others. Giving a network, giving network access to other players targeting the same customers does not improve the economics. It rather makes them worse. Moreover, the mobile market is already very competitive, in parts even margin negative, and therefore including wireless on the local loop would lead to further price cuts in itself. The LLU committee report commissioned by the D, uh, DOC. CELC supports the formation of working groups for fixed line LLU in dealing with pricing and uh, technical matters. However, CELC believes that these working groups must include as a prerequisite terms of reference and beforehand audit information of telecom exchanges, associate facilities, and subscriber information must be made available. Salsi recommends that the authority must make use of the 23rd May 2007 LLU committee report recommendations, wherein the recommendations state that there should be a combination of three options uh, with regards to LLU, the formation of a management entity by the incumbent with agreed terms and conditions with the COSA, similar to that of BT Open Reach, Access to the associated facilities and fixed local lines by all licensees. The authority must be capac capacitated to conduct site inspections. Develop regulated guidelines for quality of service of the loop, maintenance of the loop, and optimization of the loop. Process concerns. There are inconsistencies, uh, inconsistencies in the contents of the discussion document, the media briefing on 22nd June 2011, and the one on, meet, one -on one meeting held with ICASA. The covering page of the Gazette discussion document, page 3, states the, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa gives notice of its intention to embark on a Section 4 inquiry process on local loop unbundling in terms of the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa Act, Act 13 of 2000, the CASA Act. The purpose of the discussion paper is to outline the authority's initial views on the process to be followed to unbundle the local loop. Subsection 2.1.5 further states, the purpose of this discussion paper is to outline the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa initial views on the process to be followed to unbundle the fixed line local loop. 
Subsection 2.242, however, states this inquiry into the unbinding of the local loop is based on the objectives of the ECA being to introduce an open access architecture to the interconnection to and use of existing electronic communication facilities as defined in the ECA. The facility is unclear on what exactly is the purpose of this inquiry and requires regulatory certainty. Uh, we made a comparison between the uh, unbundling of the fixed line local loop with uh, the um, network edge on a mobile, mobile network, and we try to highlight here the differences. We believe the principles of the fixed line local loop cannot be carried over to the mobile network edge, and, and this will lead to more likely unintended consequences. The architecture differs substantially in terms of intelligence, dedicated physical line, replaced by an air interface where control takes place at the core of the network. The, the, uh, in the middle of the two diagrams, the one is a 2G network on, uh, the, and the bottom diagram is a 3G network. <laughs> but the current cell C network architecture is not possible to extract the subscriber information from the BTS or the node B. Any attempt to extract subscriber information may also uh, result in subscriber privacy breach. The ABIS and Lube interfaces transfer the information from the subscriber through the BTS to the core network where processing takes place. <clears throat> Existing models to share facilities in the mobile telco uh, market. We all, we all know there's MVNO, CPS, and BTS. CELC has been a, pi a pioneer of mobile virtual network operator market by launching South Africa's first MVNO, Virgin Mobile. Currently, CELC is implementing a mobile virtual network enabler, MVNE platform, which will ena which enable us to launch a multitude of MVNOs in a more efficient manner. To this, to this end, CELC is currently proactive contacting suitable parties to discuss MVNO opportunities. We are all aware that the carry pre-selection regulations are finalized and the implementation, implementation date for CPS is November 2011. The, on, the BTS, on the BTS side, CELC has outsourced its base stations to American Towers, which can be shared with other parties. Additionally, additionally CELC has already shares its BTS and lease facilities with other ECNN licensees. Specific comments with regards to the questions in the discussion paper. Is LLU reasonable, feasible, and acceptable according to the Electronic Communication Facilities Leasing Regulations? The, uh, the um, definition of uh, facility or electronic communication facility is silent. It doesn't make mention of local loop. However, Section 43.8 of the ECA preempts such an inquiry and states that the authority must prescribe a list of essential facilities, including but not limited to electronic communication facilities, including without limitation local loops, subloops, and associated electronic communication facilities for accessing subscribers and provisioning services. To date, the authority has not prescribed such list. With regards to the Parliament, Portfolio Committee, DOC, and NICASA. We are all aware that the Minister has called for the authority to work closely with the DOC in the implementation of local loop unbundling. We are also aware that the Parliament Portfolio Committee on Communication has requested both the DOC and ICASA to complete a regulatory impact assessment on local loop unbundling. So C is uncertain if this request, this, request, this request is completed and believes that the outcome will assist in, in the implementation process of LLU. CELC <coughs> also believes or further believes in the absence of verifiable information with regards to the status, location, and numbers on telecom exchanges and associated facilities, it's difficult to determine the feasibility of unbundling the local loop. The different forms of LLU that will be applicable to the South African market. So I believe all LLU um, four options mentioned by ECOSHA should be available for requesting parties. We are all aware that the bitstream wholesale access is uh, the least intervene or with uh, intervention from the parties. Line sharing where um, Telcom provides voice to the subscriber and um, the access seeker provides the data service to the subscriber. Full loop unbundling is where the access seeker takes control of the entire loop itself. And then sub loop unbundling is where the access seeker uh, uses the extreme point of the network edge of the fixed line network. We have two case studies, um, a rural fixed line service provision and a case study on BT open reach, which is briefly explain the success and the principles of BT open reach. Uh, Mutibi will take us uh, a good example from his hometown with regards to uh, an exchange that can be used uh, for the purpose of LLU. Thanks, Harish. Yeah, um, Chair, I think the, the following slides 
I think uh, the, the, the whole idea behind is to demonstrate practicalities in terms of how the unbundling of the local loop, especially FIX, can actually benefit communities, including all of us in, in, in this presentation. Now, <clears throat> some weeks ago, we've heard, I think, Telcom has been mentioning issues around fears of either losing jobs if the unbundling of the local loop is implemented in this country. Now, I, I come from a rural area, and for, from, for, for the past 35 years, I've seen quite a number of potential business that could be derived out of this whole business. Now, the pictures that I want to share with you this morning is just a demonstration that there are a number of copper wires that have been laid, overlay in some of the areas. And in this particular area, it's a village in Jane Fess and Lenkawi in Limpopo. Now, if you look at the tidiness and uh, the potential benefits that can be derived from this business, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that a number of cables have been cut. And for me as an entrepreneur, I mean, this is an opportunity for me to come in and, and do some work, clean up or make sure that these kind of cables are actually put in use. Now, the fear that perhaps Telcom has in terms of unbundling, it might be an interpretation that many of the people that are making decisions are not staying in the rural areas. And I mean, coming from CELC, I stay in a rural area. I've seen a business opportunity for somebody to go in there and start maintaining those cables. That's a business. And I think we need to be consistent on the fact that, you know, if you listen to government, I mean, the president of this country has mentioned on many occasions that we need to create jobs. As CELC, as Harish has indicated, we have come up with very innovative models, the MVNO, with Virgin Mobile, I'm sure you're aware we have created jobs indirectly through that formation of that institution or that company. And I'm of the view that if you take the last mile, which some of us see those cables every day, tomorrow Telcom can actually come up with an enterprise development initiative which will benefit not necessarily people in urban but in rural. So, I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting business opportunity. And, and I think we've all been talking about empowering the locals so that they can have local presence and make sure that there's economic development in those areas. And what Harish has actually presented earlier on, we're trying to demonstrate, I think, as CELC, that from a mobile point of view, there are quite a number of other initiatives that have been implemented, your MVNEs, CPS, and the MVNO itself. Now, by unbundling, Perhaps we just need to not to talk too technical. I think we need to look at it from an economic point of view. Now, the picture that you see there, this used to be a telecom exchange and a post office. It's been converted into an undertaker. Now, obviously, there was an innovation by the person who runs that undertaker because there was an exchange. And if there was a community engagement coming from areas where I grew up in, if you don't engage with communities, certain things might not necessarily happen. And I believe for telecom, if we're talking unbundling, it's an opportunity to get into rural so that individuals like all of us in this presentation can own that exchange and bring some innovation and provide services. Now, if I look at this Jane Fess or in particular Glen Kawi, my question has always been if telecom could have come and, and engaged with the community, there could have been some beautiful business opportunities that could have been derived from that opportunity. Now, I guess perhaps we might be talking to regulatory issues, but I think for us as CELC, we are seeing the unbundling as another model of unlocking the, the, the whole economic value and making sure that you bring in communities and develop those entrepreneurs in those areas. So basically the pictures that I had, it was just a demonstration because I, I just felt as CELC, we need to break the myth of saying that, you know, the unbundling, there might be fears, people will lose jobs, etc. I, I mean, th th this is an opportunity. And uh, if one listened to the Minister of Communication, we've heard about the 2020 vision. And I believe, I think we need to encourage Telcom, all of us, including CELC, that this is an opportunity to fast track the deployment of broadband. And Harish, in the next slides, he'll be t taking you through of the BT outreach uh, uh, initiative that they've done. And we've got literature that confirms that the unbundling in the UK has actually fast-tracked broadband rollout in that area. So 
I think in South Africa we're not unique. It's just a question of fear, which we just need to make sure that we can assist. And, and, and as I said, uh, we need to engage communities, we need to engage entrepreneurs in those rural areas. There are a number of models that can be implemented. Now, from a technical point of view, uh, Chair, we, we are aware that when we talk broadband in this country, there's always been focus, particularly in urban areas. Now, I just want to re-emphasize the issue of rural, because if government has actually placed an instruction to all of us, including my competitors, that by 2020 we should make sure that all rural communities, including urban, have got access to broadband services. We all know that in terms of connecting government and ensuring that we've got efficient and effective way of communication, we need broadband in villages. And I'm of the view that what I've seen in those areas with telecoms infrastructure, without knowing the deficit, because I'm saying that if tomorrow you can outsource this particular exchange or exchanges to the locals, we can derive potential revenues within time. Because if I stay in Butoko in my area, people know me. If I start selling services, I engage with them. And I think that's the part that perhaps telecom has missed. Because we normally see telecom running around in the villages, but the engagement with communities so that people can begin to appreciate what an exchange is, what can you get services out of it. And I believe this is one way of trying to make sure that telecom doesn't become too big. We've, we've seen the annual reports. There's been statements from government that telecom needs to find ways of running itself efficiently. Now, this is one opportunity, and we believe that it's not unfair for the authority to come up with this kind of intention through a process that the minister has pronounced. So I'll just pause there. I just thought maybe it's important just to share a case study because I just felt as CLC we need to kill the myth about job losses and all that. This is an enterprise development initiative that can transform this country big time. And I believe that telecom should be excited that this is one way of trying to accelerate job creation. And those innovative young boys and girls in rural can use the very same cables, provide video on demand and others to the locals. And I believe that if you don't have local presence, this is normally what will happen. You'll have infrastructure that is sitting idling because you, don't, you are not in touch with your very same customers. And as CLC, we've seen it. It's working for us. You need to be in touch with your customers and communities. So I think Harish will take us through the BT, then we'll be going towards our closure. Thanks. Thanks. Um, the case study two uh, with regards to BT open reach. The UK's uh, initiative uh, on unrunning of BT's fixed lines accelerated broadband internet penetration in the UK. Uh, the framework that was adopted was, and, they, and it was on the premise that the framework should encourage efficient, sustainable competition in the access <coughs> services uh, side of the network. The BT open reach is separate from BT itself to provide wholesale line rental, local loop unbundling, which includes fully unbundled lines and shared unbundled lines, as well as internet, uh, internet services. And the requirement was at same prices using the same processes to the same timescales. The undertaking from between uh, OpenReach and Ofcom was based on five key principles. Equivalence of inputs, basically use the same processes within our products for all licensees. Sharing of information, we're all, uh, obliged to share commercial information about things such as product launches with all licensees in the same way to ensure that no one gains a commercial advantage. Protecting your information have a duty to ensure that the customer confidential information is protected and is not shared inappropriately. Systems, the system and processes to deliver products are the same for all licensees, so everyone, ex ex everyone ex uh, experiences the same degree of reliability and performances. Incentivize incentivization, open reach people have a scorecard <coughs> for personal uh, bonus inter uh, incentivization, which reflects responsibility to deliver fair and equal access to products. Open reach is not incentivized by the performance of any other division of BT. Uh, we come to conclusions. Okay. okay. Thanks, Harish. Um, yeah, um, the committee, in, in, by way of concluding our presentation, I think from CELC, what we'd like to caution the, the authorities in implementing any of the interventions 
we just need to be careful not to rush. I think we need to have a well-calculated option of introducing any model that we want to do in this country for the benefit of all of us as business. And it's very important that through that process, ambiguity should be avoided because from our reading, we've always waited for the day when fixed line or unbundling of the fixed line is actually pronounced. But at the same time, we support that this process should find closure because we've been dealing about this issue for quite some time. And we need to recognize the fact that other countries have implemented what South Africa intends doing and it has benefited their countries. From a GDP point of view, we are aware that as ICT, we need to be seen as one of our biggest contributors. And we just want to encourage ICASA that in this process, let's make sure that whatever we do has got positive results because we want to see jobs being created. And I must emphasize sustainable jobs being created and enterprise development being initiated in some of the areas, including urban. Now, <clears throat> we basically support the formation of the special committee. We believe that the framework for ensuring that fixed line local loop takes place, like as I've said before, no rush, but we need to recognize that certain principle has to be done, particularly from a governance point of view. I must say up front that, you know, Telcom might have done quite a lot of, you know, connectivity in some of the areas. But if ICASA is not going to give itself an opportunity to understand the dynamics and the challenges that Telcom claims to have, I think we don't want to have a country where we come back and begin to say we should have engaged. I think engagement in this process is very key. We've seen it in our business as CELSI, hence our success, because we continue to engage, and it's one way of trying to get a buy-in as well, if you want to introduce new options. <clears throat> now, in terms of the committees that have provided recommendation to the authority, I think it's important, perhaps some years ago, certain provisions in the Act might not have been necessary to implement, but I think if one looks at what the committee proposed 2007 and what government, I think I must emphasize what government intends doing, it's important to align the outcome of this particular activity to, to government imperatives because if by unbundling we'll be addressing issues of the 10 points of government as we do as CELSI, I think we'll support that process. It's very, very important. Now, in terms of complexity, I think I've, I've tried to, we have tried to demonstrate that Yes, I think as engineers, we might be saying unbundling is a difficult activity to do. But my limited knowledge, which I still want to emphasize, if the committee can ask Telcom a question and say, how difficult will it be to take one of the exchanges tomorrow? Let's do a case study and see how young or older people can bring innovation in that exchange and provide services to the very same customers. Because I think for me, it's more about innovation because we, we talk about ICT bringing new changes into this country. I want to re-emphasize contributing to the economic development of this country. Now, we can't be held back by fears of things that we are not sure of. And I, I still want to say that if people go to rural, we are all innovative. I grew up in that area Today I'm staying in this area, but it doesn't mean that I got clever because I stay in Midrand. I got clever because I grew up in Budok. And, and I had to maneuver because, you know, you stay in a rural area, you have to be creative. And I believe that what this process is going to help in this country is to bring lots of innovators. And that's why I, I, as CELC, we're very excited. And if Telcom wants to engage with us, we can give them ideas on how to unbundle. It's, it's very easy. Now, and on the issue of regulatory certainties, I, I think this one, it's, it's very key. My colleague has indicated that on numerous occasions we have met with ICASA, we have read press releases, and there's been quite a number of conflicting information. Now, what we want to put on record as CELC is unbundling of the local loop as we have read the published gazette refers to fixed line. And our understanding on the regulatory process, any deviation from a gazette, you need to come back with an addendum. And I think it's very important for ICASA that 
any deviation from what you've gazetted needs to be done procedurally because we don't want to come here and have arguments, courts, lawyers, etc. <clears throat> We're all good friends. And as citizens of this country, we need to begin not to fight through courts. So we just want to advise ICASA and say, please, for this process to be concluded, let's stick to the fixed line. If we are talking mobile, as we are advising you, let be an addendum and let's follow the normal process. I'm not a lawyer myself, but I've been advised that that's the best way to do to avoid any collusion in future. Now, the issue of DOC, in con conclusion, we want to encourage the authority that you must continue to engage with the Department of Communication, in particular the Ministry, and the Portfolio Committee, as my colleague has outlined, because we believe that if Telcom, as much as it's a licensee, you've got an opportunity, being independent as a CASA, to discuss this matter from a governance stance point of view, because we believe that government still has shareholding within Telcom, and it's, it's within the interest of this country in terms of development to make sure that the shareholder, which is government, must make that pronouncement. We believe that, yes, they are a licensee, but ultimately, all the shareholders of Telcom, this will be an opportunity for them to be given an opportunity to run their own new business. <clears throat> and we believe that it talks, it's not misaligned, because we support this process. Concluding, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think we, we were trying to demonstrate and share that uh, the process that you have started, we support it wholeheartedly because we believe it will benefit all of us. And secondly, we believe as a mobile operator as well, there's an opportunity to be derived from the fixed and bundling of the local loop as well because we continue to engage with the likes of Telcom. And... Um, yeah, I think I'll pause there, Chair, and thank you very much. Unless if there's any last comment from my colleagues. Okay, I don't see that, maybe. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Matibi, for, for that interesting presentation. In particular, your two uh, case studies. I wonder if there's a ref of Tocom in the room who has heard about that. Anyone here? Ish. <coughs> um, can I suggest that when you have your opportunity to question Telcom that you can ask the question? It's how difficult is it? You ask the question. But we will start our questions with Norma. Thank you, Celsi. Um, my first question to Celsi um, is um, noting that Celsi's view that a CASA might be overstepping the mark by introducing the wireless local loop into the discussion. Could you comment on uh, MWEP's view that local loop and bundling should um, also include the wireless last mile access? Uh, the wire is. Uh, I'm uh, Barrett Sayed. Uh, I'm the technical uh, manager for Celsi. Um, by uh, last mile, what do you mean by last mile? Celsi is of is of the view that Jikasa should only concentrate on the fixed line local loop. Yes. But MWEP is of the view that also Jikasa should focus on including the wireless local loop. So the thing is that uh, as we uh, uh, clearly presented in this slide, uh, wireless uh, unbundling is not possible. It's not as easy as, uh, it's not, in fact, it's not feasible at all. You can't uh, unbundle a wireless uh, network because uh, by unbundling you mean that you will uh, tap into the network, get the information from the network and it will be utilized by some other uh, stakeholder, which is not possible in case of uh, wireless. Why? Because the air interface, which deals with the mobile interacting with the BTS or the WBTS, uh, 2G and 3G, and then that data is transferred transparently. It's not decoded. It's uh, uh, the voice and the data both are transferred to another node, which is called the RNC or the BSC. 
and at, at that point uh, some other processing takes place where data and voice is separated but still the subscriber information is not decoded and uh, still the subscriber may not have access to uh, the network and he may be denied access so and and but unbundling at that point is still not possible the only way that you can unbundle is through an MVNO where you go and you put your own uh, system uh, in on the core side and uh, that's how you can share otherwise it's complete sharing the the only way to share a wireless uh, network is if you go for a complete partnership with CELC we can't let anybody tap into the line and he can he'll have to develop his own network behind it it's not like we do the processing for them and then they take it from us uh, was I clear so is that a definition of wireless local loop there's uh, uh, as far as the the mobile network is concerned there is no wireless local loop there can be no wireless local loop So you're not aware of any jurisdiction that has done that before? Uh, I'm not aware of anything. As I said, the only, the only way possible for you to do that is to build another infrastructure. Like, for example, as I said, if you look there, there's BSCs and RNCs. After that, the, the information goes to the core. So the information that is going to the core can then be, <clears throat> then you can put your own core there. That is the only way you can unbundle. Otherwise, there is no possibility. My second question. Yes, Do you think LLU will help to increase uh, broadband penetration in South Africa? Uh, Mark Sindov, I'm the strategy implementation executive. Well, I think we're going back here to the point that we already had during the discussions on MTR. Uh, our view is that any market where it's oligopolistic or, or monopolistic uh, by improving the competitive situation and that is uh, possibly being done by LLU uh, will in the end uh, indirectly drive down prices so that in fact then should help also to improve uh, increase the broadband penetration in this country so yes we do believe so <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. I just wanted to find out if you are aware of a definition of a wireless local loop in terms of the ITU, and the, is it the OECD, and the, um, I'm not sure of the third one, but uh, it's the ITU and the OECD. How is it defined? I'm, I'm not very sure uh, how the wireless local loop is defined by ITUT. Uh, but as I, I'd be reiterating myself when I say that uh, it, uh, in case of a mobile cellular network, uh, the unbundling uh, of data, uh, whether it be uh, only data or voice, uh, is not possible. It can only be possible if you build another infrastructure, which I say that you will have to uh, go into a complete partnership with the the operator, or you, <coughs> or you excuse me, or you develop your, uh, or you go and share the core, which is, uh, you share the network, like an MVNO, where we have a, uh, where we provide you SIMs. The SIM basically camps onto our network, and the billing is separate. Yeah. Just, just to add to my colleague, there, it's Mutibi Ramosi. I think in terms of the discussion document, we, we were guided by the definition as presented, and hence, I've actually reiterated this statement that in terms of our contribution, our intention was to expose other models from a mobile point of view, which can easily and currently be referred or defined as a way of unbundling <coughs> the wireless in terms of a model. But I think technically, if you look at the definition as presented in the discussion document, it talks to the fixed. And, and I think uh, Harish did allude to the fact that if we want to do any other things, especially from a regulatory point of view, it becomes important that we should not rush, do proper analysis, because if, if the committee believes that there is a definite, a different definition of and bundling of the local loop, but for wireless, that can call in for a committee that we set up in 2007 to go through a process, because we believe that it's very dangerous 
to basically start a process on something that has not been referred to. So if we want to satisfy ourselves, I, th I think for the benefit of transparency, it becomes important that, yes, we can bring wireless. I think we've got researchers in the country and all over the world. If wireless, by definition, can be done in terms of unbundling, I think let's not rush that for now. But I think the discussion, because it's more to the fixed line, we can still have an opportunity to go and do thorough research. Because, but the models that we have presented, the MVNO, the CPS, the MVNE, we believe that let's not go beyond that because then it will call for a total review which might take another five years. And, and I think we just want to caution Icas on that. But yeah, from literature, no. And other countries, there's one country that we've heard of, it's Sweden, if I'm not wrong, we can just check, but there's no information about any other country. Thank you. Okay. Um uh, Vodacom has, has argued that uh, Bitstream is a service and not a facility. What, what is Cell C's view on this? We haven't really given that question a thought, but um, personally, I mean, on my background is product marketing, I would probably also consider Bitstream rather a product or a service than, a, uh, than anything else, uh, rather not a facility in itself. So I tend to agree with that point. Thank you, Chair. I've got a, a number of questions for Celsi. I take it from your presentation that copper is still valuable. So would you, so I'm glad you would say, won't you just say that quite loudly so that the telecom people can hear you because they've just joined us. They missed your story about rural exchanges. So again, is, is copper still valuable? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, do you, if, if copper is still valuable, do you believe that unbundling the local loop would increase the number of fixed lines in use? Does it have the potential to increase the number of fixed lines in use? Yeah, th th thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think to go, going back to the issue that I've raised earlier on, it's, it's more from a business point of view. I think, yes, definitely. But depending on the type of services that one wants to provide, I still believe that the uptake is there. And it will just depend on the engagement in terms of what the subscribers want. But yes. <clears throat> W would Cell C consider investments required for full loop unbundling if full loop unbundling was to become a reality? I think we stated in our submission that um, those who benefit should pay. So if you want to play in the space, they should pay. And a, a further question. If if copper is still valuable, would you not? Is it? Is there not the potential that the ATA price bundles for data have been cannibalizing their own customer base? I think uh, we can't make a statement. We can. Uh, if you look at the numbers, I don't think that cannibalization is happening currently. Thanks. I've got a question on access line deficit. Um, I don't think you touched it on in, in your presentation. Um, would CELC be willing to contribute to us um, the access line um, deficit recovery scheme? 
Well, I think you already you make an assumption that SALC will be uh, using the the loop itself. Uh, in the I think uh, as uh, one of the other submitters has uh, put forward that, um, and including Telcom as well, that the CASA has the um, regulatory financial statements, and they indicate that in those statements they prove there's an access line deficit. For me, it's for ICASA to make sure or confirm that there is indeed a uh, access line deficit. If there is access, uh, like I say, those who play in the space need to pay. So if there is an access line deficit, and it's proven, and parties access seekers want to play in the space, they should contribute to it. Thank you. Um, in the event that the copper loop is unbundled, would CLC make use of it? Uh, we come again, I mean, we get to the, end of the process. It's difficult uh, at this point in time because we don't have the numbers. For us to develop a business case, we need the numbers of where the exchanges are, the status of the exchange, the numbers of active lines. So uh, to make a positive business case, we require that information. So at this point in time, no, we're not, uh, without the information, we cannot give a definitive answer. Okay. Now Cisco yeah. has come up with a predictor model. And they've predicted that by 2015, um, at least 66 percent of all mobile traffic will be video. In your view, is this sustainable, or would fixed light connectivity, or what other people refer to as um, Wi-Fi offloading, be more appropriate for the South African market? Yeah, I think maybe just to answer that one before we get to the second one, the, the issue of whether Celsi could use telecoms last mile on copper is the issue of quality as well. I think, as, as we have indicated, we, we know that Telcom has laid f copper for quite some time, and obviously one needs to be very, very careful in terms of what services you provide to your consumers. Now, obviously, it's an engagement model as well, just to understand from Telcom in terms of what's on the ground or overhead, and if it's something of good quality, I guess it's business, we can always talk. I mean, I don't see why not. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, with regards to high demand uh, type of services, for example, uh, video on demand, um, we believe that uh, wireless is not an appropriate technology uh, to deliver those services. As you know, as a licensee, we have uh, a certain quality of service requirements. Um, and uh, with regards to that type, you also have alternatives like fiber to the curb, fiber to the home. So if a licensee indeed wants to provide or meet that demand, they may have to look at other technologies in meeting that demand. All right. As a follow-up question to that, if, um, if we to come up with unbundling of the fiber local loop, would CLC support that? Uh, I don't understand the question. Uh, fiber uh, local loop? Uh, Last mile connectivity using fiber. Uh, are you saying... There is existing fiber to the home currently. No, I'm saying if they if they were, if as an op if operators had fiber to the home, would you support unbundling of that last mile? No, no. I, I think yeah. Let's talk technical. Um, the, the 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 open access model that we're all in pushing for right now will provide an opportunity. What goes to my house, I mean, we 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 can have any of the operators providing me a service to my house. Now, not necessarily understanding whether are you saying, I just want to be practical. You've got an exchange. From an exchange, there's a fiber that comes to my house. And are you saying that in that particular fiber, Celsi will then support whether that fiber should be open to other people? Yes. Yeah, I guess, I mean, that's, I think in terms of these discussions, that's what we're saying for telecom. We're saying anybody, I mean, if I have fiber that comes into my house, currently, technically, it can be any operator. And that's why we're pushing for open access, because you're providing a service. From an infrastructure point of view, the infrastructure is there. It can be you. And all of us who want to provide services can go through that fiber to the home. All of us. So that's why, I mean, on fiber, we're talking open access. Thank you. Yeah, and by the way, it's a commercial deal between all of us. Thanks. Um, your, your case study of, of uh, rural uh, village in 
Limpopo is certainly very interesting and um, makes me wonder uh, you know when we consider working groups on different aspects of LLU uh, do you think uh, there might be value in having a working group that looks specifically at um, rural unbundling and uh, enterprise development Thanks, Councillor Curry. Yeah, like as I said, we, we offer from CELC that uh, I, I think seeing, seeing that infrastructure in that format, if, if Telcom was to give me that particular poll for a week, because we're looking at issues of safety, issues, I mean, there are issues in terms of bylaws. Now, if I come from Butokwa and I see a pole with hanging copper like that, I get worried because we've got children who might not even know why those cables are hanging. They can cut, people can start hanging themselves, God forbid. But I think it's very, very important because, I mean, if you look at what you're seeing, because this is factual. Now, hence I'm saying it's, it's important that if you engage, my chief, for example, if you talk to Chief Machaka, if Telcom comes, Ikasa comes and say, guys, you've got two exchanges in your village, Telcom, because for transportation purposes, we're spending more money in terms of our OPEX, can we form companies in rural areas to have cooperatives? We put models. If ICASA brings some innovative regulatory frameworks, we failed with the USALs. This is an opportunity of coming up with a USAL, which then you have local empowerment. And I'm saying, if I were to clean up that cable, I mean that whole pole, I can get 10 rands or 200 rands. That's a job creation. At least I can buy bread at home tonight if I've done that job. So I think for me, like as I said, it's more about a willingness because protecting business in some areas might not be necessary. We might just be sitting here arguing of things because people need to go to these areas. I mean, I asked Telcom, some of my friends, I said, but come to my village, bro. I mean, I can tell you by 2020, we'll meet what Minister Padiachi wants because here, here is evidence. Now, I don't know if this poll, for example, those cables were cut for a purpose, and I need to be very careful. Remember that Telcom has migrated some of the exchanges, they've changed into digital exchange, etc. Some of the sites might not be necessarily feasible because of distances. But if this was explained to my chief, that look, don't be worried by seeing cables lying around on the pole, then from an environmental issue, I don't have to worry from my bylaws, because as a citizen, I need to be careful that we take care of environment issues from a safety point. And even maybe those poles, if are not used, cut and use it them for something else because there's safety issues. I think for me, it's purely just a citizen issue. But if it's business, yes, I agree. Let's get rural communities, put them together with some of us as operators. Let's think of good models of empowering rural communities. And we can advance to the government goals and all of us by 2020 will be smiling. Thanks. Yeah, a view has emerged that for the sake of completeness of the LLU process, the authority must consider to promulgate a supplementary regulation in terms of Section 443M of the ECA. What is your view on that? Thank you. It's Jimmy Pack from the Regulatory Department. Um, if I refer you back to Section 43.8, um, which prescribes that, um, which rather mandates the authority to come up with a list of essential facilities that are required to be list, that are, that are sorry, that are, that are required to be uh, licensed rather by ECNS licenses in terms of Section 43.1. Um, until that process has been done, I think we're a little bit premature in supplementing existing regulations. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the slide, uh, the case study for Jennifer. In relation to that, uh, Telcom on their proposal, they say that if uh, LLU is a success, uh, they will expect as, uh, access seekers to fund the cost that they will incur to facilitate the, the LLU. What is your view? Do you think is a fair proposal? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, th thanks for that question. I think this is one area which we might have to be innovative again. You know that we've got the Universal Service Fund. And I think we've got an opportunity, I think, as a committee, 
if, for example, I mean, the case study that I've shared with you, it might be costly just to get somebody to run the very same copper into my house and provide video on demand or any other. Let's not be shy. I think if ICASA, the DOC, can complete, fast track the underserved area definitions, the needy people definitions, we call everybody in this room and find a way of utilizing the USF. Because I believe, I mean, we know that telecom where it comes from politically. Now, and we need to recognize the fact that if telecom doesn't have money to redirect those cables back into my house, there's fund. I think let, let's not be shy. And if the rules allow, let's make use of the fund. And uh, then with TV Associates and the uh, Jimmy Pack partnership, we run that exchange in, in Jane Fez. But then, then, then remember in terms of the act, you use that money to expand ex uh, uh, your infrastructure or fund an existing or new. So I think for, for, for the committee, perhaps you can lobby that we need the definitions quick then we can utilize those definitions to get money into the USF because here's, here's uh, infrastructure that is sitting and which we can fast track some of the government needs because we're all concerned. I mean, if the president and the minister of communication says 2020 is a timeline, we need to act. So I think, yeah, let's not waste time, guys. I mean, sorry to use different language. Committee, thanks. Thank you, Salsi. I have um, three questions from Sepang Laseba from the CWU. The first question is, do you have any case study on job creation after implementation of LLU in developing countries? I can upfront say from the literature I don't have, but I think from practical, I need to come back to South Africa and say, with this we can. I, I don't believe that sometimes we need to look at other case studies. I think we need to be practical. What exists, let's be creative and create something new. And, uh, yeah, I think we can create jobs. That, that I can assure you on this. Thank you. And then the second question, is it fair to compare South Africa to Britain? It continues, because I don't think it will be fair to compare you to British Mobile as your services are far apart. Not sure what's meant. I think that's a difficult question, uh, it's, uh, or unfair question. It's, it's, you have to be more specific, compare in what, uh, what type of market or what type of area, and then we can provide a proper response. The third question is, if ICASA can regulate or apply LLU in rural areas only, are you prepared to go there and compete? <laughs> Uh, I don't want to ask who asked that question. You know, I, I just want to kill this myth, guys. Um, you know, rural. You know, when government introduced and gave us tar roads, tar roads, I, I just want to give an analogy. When we had access to tar roads, people bought cars. Immediately, there were make motor mechanics. I know one in my area. That was job creation. Now, that guy, he's got a very nice area where he's now fixing cars because there was a tar road. We got electricity. People buy, started buying fridges, microwaves. Then we had some technicians who are now fixing. Now, you can imagine tomorrow if you bring this unbundling to my village tomorrow. Tomorrow, I can assure you, some of the enterprise development companies, which I won't mention, they can bring those servers. Innovative people can provide us with games, children programs, because that's what we want in the rural. You know, we are very innovative, just like people in the urban areas. It's just that we don't have those facilities. And this is one opportunity that we can look. So in terms of competing, you're going to see wonders. You just open up the rurals, you'll see something that you have never seen in this country. It's happening. Sure. Thank you, Matibi. The fourth question from the CWU pertains to digital migration, so I won't ask it here. We now have a question from Dominic Cull of ISPA. And he says, what definition of MVNO do, does self C subscribe to? Is this resale of ECS or does it involve leasing of facilities? Um, so C doesn't have a specific definition. We don't limit ourselves to uh, certain parts of the value chain. So uh, we are doing pure resellers, as you're aware, like Red Bull Mobile. Uh, we are doing full MVNOs, which is uh, something like Virgin. 
um, that is discussed case by case with the partners that we approach, where we discuss what parts of the value chain do they want and can they actually uh, cover, and which parts of the value chain should we cover. Thank you. And then from Amish China, Valvini, we have a question here that says, in your written submission, you state in clause 2.5, Celsi further requests the authority to allow the commercial implementation of MVNEs, which will address the perceived shortcomings in wireless services at the edge of the wireless mobile network, end quote. Is Celsi currently prepared to entertain MVNE discussions with parties who will operate their own MVNE with their own mobile co network codes? And what will be Celsi's requirements? What do you as Celsi expect the authority to deliver to create an enabling environment? Two separate questions by the sounds of it. I'm not sure that I fully understand the question because we are currently implementing our own MVNE platform. Uh, as an MVNE, uh, therefore we are uh, negotiating with MVNOs, but uh, there is no point of negotiating with other MVNEs because we're doing the platform ourselves. Thank you very much, Solsi, for that presentation, and uh, we're pretty well on time. Well done to everyone.